Shane, appreciate you being here. Ross, good to see you, buddy. Yeah, happy New likewise. Year. Happy New Year to you. At some point, the happy New Year thing like starts to. Yeah, what, what I guess we're like? in February. It still feels like yeah. 2020, start of 2024. We get like, we get like 14, 14 days usually. All right, I'm, I'm milking <laughs> yeah. it then. But um, no, I appreciate it. I've actually, the, what made me even think to do this is I take a lot of coffee meetings, just meet, network different people. And so many times I'm just like, man, this is just like a super interesting conversation. Could provide a lot of value to people. Definitely provides a lot of value to me. And so um, I was like, why don't I just record one of these? And we hadn't caught up in a while and I was going to hit you up just for, you know, get drinks, get coffee. And I was like, you know what, let me just book a little podcast recording space and get it all on film. We can cover a few different things and I'm sure I'll learn some stuff and it'll be cool for maybe other people to see as well. I love it. Every time I see you at a broker open or something, we end up going on, you know, off to the side and just chatting about all the different Every, conflicting opinions and all of that. And yeah. Every what's time going on with the market. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, yeah, so you just made a, a switch to, um, uh, Barrett financial. That's right. Um, and you were at uh, VIP when I met you. I mean, yeah. we've, we've been friends now for what, three, three, four plus years. And so you were there when I met you. So you've been there for a long yeah. time. So I was over at VIP Mortgage for four or five years. Loved it. Have nothing bad to say. Um, one of the best mortgage banking companies out there, top 20 company nationally. Um, and I made the switch over to the broker world. Uh, it's a little bit more dynamic. There's more opportunity to do some different things, such as not only residential lending, but commercial lending, hard money lending, HELOCs. You know, so I get kind of my my hands in a, a little bit of everything now. Yeah. And then you know, our rates are some of the most competitive out there now too. So to be able to offer that to clients and agent partners is, is crucial. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I've, I've had, um, I've had clients in the past that actually have used Barrett financial mm -hmm. on a variety of different loan products. Um, so I've always had a really good experience with them. Had no idea until I think today that you had made that move over and, uh, yeah, it's a cool, it's a cool umbrella to be under. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about that though, is the, what is kind of the difference between, I know it moves, and then you mentioned like Barrett's kind of part of like a broker model. Mm -hmm. What was kind of the model of kind of VIP and where you'd come from? Like question. what is kind of the difference between, between that? Absolutely. So a, a mortgage banker is based on a, a correspondent model and that's going to be the cross countries, the fairways, the VIP mortgages, kind of the powerhouse companies that you hear a lot of right now. Um, so, so essentially there's three different levels of how, when you're a mortgage banker, you sell the loan off to an investor, let's just say Chase Bank, for example. So it's easy to understand. When we close a loan, we sell it off to Chase Bank, then they pay out us or the mortgage banker. There's three different tiers. There's the loan officer, then there's the branch, and then there's a corporate level. So all three of those tiers need to get paid out. Whereas when you go over the broker model, it's actually a wholesale model. So it's essentially, you are either the branch as an LO or you're standalone, and then you pay a little flat fee to the actual you know, corporate level, and that's it. So that extra you know, tier goes all into your pricing, making it more competitive. Got yeah. it. Gives yep. you, the broker, the loan officer, a little bit more, sounds like flexibility yep. to kind of adjust term rate, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and then do you guys, so are you working mostly with kind of like the the, D, the UWMs of the world? And kind so of that is the biggest now wholesaler investor in, in the world right now. So Quicken okay. was for the last, you know, 15, 20 years. But UWM has since taken over in the purchase market. So they are the most popular. However, you know, and I always say one of the reasons, so I, I was actually looking at starting my own brokerage. And uh, my girlfriend's dad actually started two of the biggest correspondent lending companies. And he's the one that kind of influenced me. He's like, dude, you got to go, you know, check out the broker model. There's, there's more skin in the game. There's more opportunity. There's more flexibility. There's more options to do creative things. So I went and looked at that and I'm like, I'm going to start my own company, especially with his backing. But what's so cool about Barrett is they allow you to be licensed in 49 states they have 120 plus investors. So we have all the creative things. I mentioned commercial lending, HELOCs, whereas like on the banker side, you might have 20 investors total, right? And they come and go and you're kind of confined to these certain areas. Um, so, so really cool opportunity, opportunity on the broker side to help clients. Yeah, it's super cool. And when you say investors, you're talking about the people buying, once you guys originate the loans, the secondary That's exactly purchasers. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, at least in my experience, um, working with Barrett, it's been super positive. Um, one of the 
topics, one of the things I kind of wanted to sort of pick your brain about and just act, even just for my own knowledge, because I understand it at a, you know, 101 type level is um, these DSCR loans, which I know um, you guys originate a lot of. I know you guys have been super competitive in that space. Mm -hmm. um, it's super interesting for me because as somebody who predominantly has represented um, kind of the retail uh, investor in the SFR space, particularly in kind of the pseudo, you know, mid to higher end luxury for short term rental Airbnb purposes, mm -hmm. um, the DSCR products or product suite, if there are multiple of them, um, really help people who maybe I think don't show a ton of income or have mm -hmm. a hard time qualifying um, for conventional mortgages, actually be able to get into a loan product that has really competitive um, leverage to be able to actually purchase cash flowing assets without having to show tons of income on their W-2 or their K-1s, exactly right. et cetera. Yep. So I'd love to kind of hear a little bit more about, I guess, I guess some of the use cases where, yeah. where you start to originate I'll, those and then yeah. actually like what goes into qualifying. And, and even before that, like, what is a DSCR That's loan? That's exactly from right. Like we'll a, start there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a little bragging right and toot my own horn humbly is, so we were the preferred lender for a lot of luxury brokerages around town. Well, what typically comes with that is either one, a lot of cash buyers or self-employed, you know, clients. So when they're self-employed, the, the benefit is, you know, they're, re they're typically making more money. They typically do a lot of write-offs and strategically to, you know, mm -hmm. save on taxable income and things like that. But that hurts them as far as getting qualified. So they're stuck in like this pigeonhole of how do I still buy a house and finance it? So this DSCR program came around and I was one of the first teams to really take advantage of it to do creative financing. So what it is essentially is you're forecasting or using re future rental income to offset the mortgage to get qualified. The advantage is you don't have to show any income whatsoever. So on the application, anything like that, you just have to show that you've been self-employed for at least two years typically. Got it. And as long as you have that history and it's an investment property, you're good to go, right? So how we do that and how we set it up is we take a normal application. We still have to pull credit. We still have to show some reserves, down payment, things like that. We could do the whole application. You find a property, and this is where I, as the lender, work very directly with an agent as yourself, and we basically pick out a property or multiple properties that might work for the client. You send me the address, and what we do is we work together. You pull comps, I look at fair market rental things, and we basically forecast what we think the future rental income will be on that property, and what we try to do is make sure that it'll cover the cost of the mortgage. However, most people don't know this. You actually don't need to do that. So we have products, and this is one of the advantages of Barrett, we have products that allow as long as it's over a zero ratio, meaning if it's generating, you know, and let's be realistic, not $1, but it could, you know, let's say it's generating $1,000 a month, we could still, and it's under the ratio of the mortgage, obviously, let's say the mortgage is 3000 it's only generating $1,000 a month, what happens is it requires a bigger down payment. It requires a higher credit score. It, higher, it requires a little bit more reserves, but we could still use it, right? And Got maybe it. the investor is going, hey, I could use this in the future because I know I'm going to refinance this into a lower rate. I'll show more taxable income and refinance it into a traditional rate term. Mm -hmm. um, the, the kind of the cliche, though, is you're going to hear a lot most lenders out there talking about a one to one ratio, yeah, right? Where they want the rental income to cover the the yeah, mortgage, or even if not a one point five, yeah, exactly, yeah, even a higher. Ratio. Usually, you hear about one to one point two five. If you're in within that ratio, we could go as low as like a six sixty credit score, right? With twenty to thirty percent down, depending on how many reserves, what your credit score is, things like that. Another beautiful thing is you will, especially you having a lot of investor clients, most traditional mortgages, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Jumbo Loans, are anywhere from max seven to 10 finance properties. On these DSCR, right. you could have you could have 100 if you want. There's no cap on it. Got it. So it's a really, really cool yeah. product. So it's not just necessarily for the self-employed individual that shows very, very low income, mm -hmm. probably has a lot of liquidity. Um, <clears throat> it's also for the people that have just maxed out their seven uh, properties using exactly right. traditional and conventional financing. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. That's and the interest cool. rates are competitive right now. So, so you know, going back a year ago, the interest rates climbed, you know, 10%-ish. 
just because it was a difficult market and there's a lot of volatility in the market. Right now, I just priced one out. That is, this guy's just says W2 employee. This, it's his first investment property, wants to use that DSCR program to move forward. And the interest rates were like 8.5% with about a half a point. So yeah, that's that's great. You yeah. carry it for a couple of years or whatever and, and you know, right. go from there. Right. And, and, and let me touch on that. So I did say W2. And the reason why I said W2, and you're like, well, why would he do that? Is because he was capped on his debt to income ratio. So a lot of people that, that can't get qualified, even with traditional W-2, they might not meet the debt-to-income ratio, which we could dive into if you want to, whereas there is no debt-to-income ratio because it's the ratio off the rental income versus just the mortgage. Yeah, so let me actually ask you about that. So will that DSCR product, so that borrower, for example, and I know they're using W-2 income, mm-hmm. <clears throat> if that person wants to go buy a new primary residence in, say, 12 months, mm-hmm. maybe he's still on that particular DSCR loan product, mm-hmm. will the will that count against his debt-to-income ratio? So that's a great question. So that is where how much rent is he receiving to offset that mortgage, right? Do you have to file the tax returns on that rent? So not necessarily. It depends on the timeline, right? So if it's a, it's, the answer in short is yes, he'd prefer to do that, right? Because you want a history of rental income. If you do not have a, a history of rental income, you typically want two years of, of history so we could average it out. If you do have rental history, and let's say you have another house and then all of a sudden you want to get into another rental property or something like that to show it being offset on the primary is we could take 75 percent of the lease and use that to cover the mortgage and that's so it even still inside show a loss what, potentially but but that still offsets it by 75 percent right that's correct and that would be before they show that rental income potentially on that's a K-1. Correct. because as soon as they file taxes on a schedule e but yes. on a schedule e yeah. or something mm-hmm. yeah on the schedule Lee, as soon as they file taxes, that whatever that amount is, the gross rents that are already will offset their liability of the of the of the mortgage, right? Correct. And so that's when if someone's looking to buy a primary, maybe a year time frame of a DSCR product where you mm-hmm. can schedule where you can file your taxes on the schedule E mm-hmm. is kind of an average, an ideal time to wait before you're not going to get dinged on the DTI that's for correct. a new primary, right? Right. Okay, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so yeah, you do sacrifice. So the advan- there's advantages and disadvantages, right? For the rate sensitive investor, um, the disadvantages, well, you know, today's more, you know, interest rates are, you know, what, six and, you know, five eighths or so. Yeah, that's and, spot on. And, you know, now I'm paying, you know, 8%, but the flip side, and yeah, maybe that's a little bit more, um, maybe that increases your monthly nut by, mm-hmm. you know, a few hundred to, you know, low thousands, but on the flip side, it's like, well, you know what? You only paid, you know, 8% of your gross income in taxes as a self-employed individual mm-hmm. because you had all of these tax advantages and, uh, and different write-offs, right? Well, so and you're setting it up as an investment too. And with that, you get to do all the tax advantages of having a rental property, right? right. The depreciation, the, the interest, interest payment. Yeah. And now speaking of interest, are these DSCR loan products, are they exclusively IO or is it principal no. and interest? Yep, it's amortized. Oh, so it is 30 year fixed. Got it. Okay. Like that. And you could do it, you know, people don't know this too, is you could do it as a, you know, you could do a cash out refinance doing the DSCR too. So even if you have a property and it's cash flowing and things like that, you could pull equity out of that home for maybe a future investment or something like that Interesting. using the DSCR as well. Yeah, no, it's great. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, at least in my experience, a lot of my, a lot of my investors, a lot of my clients um, are in that sort of similar situation. Mm-hmm. Um, they, you know, they don't, you know, it's not that they don't, nobody likes paying taxes, but they're looking to maximize every tax advantage within the tax code as possible, which sometimes could hamper and limit their ability for, you know, large loan balances, mm-hmm. which kind of in the luxury Airbnb space, and I say luxury, I know it's somewhat of an ambigu- ambiguous term, but um, really that two to $3 million price point um, gives you an opportunity to put a, p- a supply and asset into the marketplace mm-hmm. that's super differentiated, that's not victim to kind of the widespread, quote unquote, you know, saturation that we've seen over the last several years. Right. Um, which I think Let, is prob- let's touch on that real quick. So, you know, we're touching on the DSCR and you're talking about this, you know, self-employed market. Some people might be like, well, I don't want to do an investment. I want to get qualified for a primary or second home. And what are those creative options? 
So another common one is called a bank statement loan, right? Mm -hmm. um, what's really cool is I have bank statement loans, which are not common just because the rate stinks and things like that. But I could go all the way down to a six month bank statement loan, right? So if you show deposits that are high enough that offset all of your expenses, mortgage, you know, payments, things like that, we could use that consistency of, you know, your self-employed income or whatever you're doing to, to offset the, the liabilities to get qualified. The most common one you're going to hear is 12 months to 24 months and 24 months being the most popular just because they're going to take that average over their expenses and things like that to get qualified. The interest rates are slightly higher on those. They're probably in the nines, give or take, with anywhere from a half a point to a point and a half, depending on where your credit score is and so forth. Got it. But it's a great one for self-employed people because you could use it for primary, second homes. And a lot of people are showing cash flow, all these deposits coming in, right? Mm -hmm. And we offset those by the expenses, the business expenses. So you provide the 24 months of business statements for to go off of. Yeah, and just for... You know, anyone listening, um, when Shane talks about a point to a point and a half, mm -hmm. uh, basically that's a percentage point of the loan balance that's required as part of the closing costs of the loan. So that's an exactly upfront right. fee, which for me as a realtor, um, it's market dependent in 2021. This didn't exist, but recently, especially within the last 12 months, um, a lot of times we'll get the uh, the sellers to pay that in the form of a seller concession, that's exactly which right. is super, which has been really common. I think it's very popular right now. Yeah, it, yeah. It, we hear about the three, two, one buy downs, the two, one buy downs um, on some of these investment loan products um, that are that cost a little bit more cash to actually close the loan. A lot of times we'll get the seller to, to fund that. So you have to be careful on the investment. Primary, second, you can. So you mentioned the temporary buy-down. You can't do any temporary buy-downs on an investment home. We can on primary and second. Secondary homes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, in, in quotations <laughs> there. Yeah. And, and there is a, so Fannie Mae did come out and just, you know, a lot of people don't know this. So second home is you do have, you are required to spend an allotment of time in the, that home, right? right? But there is a gray area because now they allow short-term rental on second homes right which is a which is a key point that not a lot of people are talking about mm -hmm. there's really three different classifications when you when you originate a loan it's you're signing documentation that you're going to live in it as a primary residence mm -hmm. secondary which is mm -hmm. part-time which is a, essentially a part-time residence correct and investment which is a full-time just just for cash flow purposes there's you're not going to be residing in the property and, and as you go from, say, primary to secondary to investment, your terms and your leverage change. So mm -hmm. as a primary resident, um, generally you're going to be subject to lower interest rates and more leverage, meaning mm -hmm. you're able to borrow more money and put maybe less down. We we hear about these 5% down primary, 3.5% in mm -hmm. some cases primary. Leverage and down payment gets a little bit and rate gets a little bit quote, you know worse as a secondary and then least favorable, I guess I should say, as an investment property. But the Airbnb space is super interesting because mm -hmm. largely a lot of these Airbnb products, or I call it second home products, um, are majority used for cash flow purposes, but they are people's second home. Mm -hmm. I mean, at least the houses that I sell to people and manage, I mean, they have their belongings there. We we create owner's closets right. that are lockable. Well, I do that for myself. We exactly. were just talking about so that. So I wouldn't even go as far as saying it's a gray area. It's, it's, it's totally legit within the classification of what qualifies for a second home loan, but you get favorable rates and terms relative to just a full-time investment property, well, which is like gray area because rental. a lot of investors are calling right now and they aren't going to live in that home part-time, right? And they, they, the first question they asked me is, you know, what are the risk implications? And I'm like, okay, well, if you show your short-term rental has 365 days on your Schedule E as far as rented out, if you get audited, that could be a problem and the note could be called. Now, typically that doesn't happen, but we are getting a lot of those phone calls. Okay. And that's why I mentioned that. Yep. Yeah, good to know. It's uh, yep. important to put the little asterisk. Oh yeah, there. for sure. And another, you know, one, I had a client call me last week and, and, they called me and they're like, Hey, you know, I want to buy an investment property. And I'm, you know, I said, you know, why wouldn't you can, and it was short term rental. Why wouldn't you consider this as a, a second home? And they go, well, I already have a second home in another state. And I said, well, you're not limited to only one second home. And that's actually comes up more than you think. And I said, think about it like this. If you want a second home by the beach and you want to go to the beach, you're allowed to do that. Oh, you want a second home out here by the golf course. You're allowed to do that too. If you want a short term rental, both those out, be my guest. 
Where I think it gets a little hairy, which I've run into in the past, is uh, say it's an Arizona resident yeah. trying to buy an Arizona property as a second home. Yeah. 100 miles is kind of the threshold. 100 miles. Got yeah. It. yeah. I've gotten away with was... 60 in LA. And yeah. actually, a guy lived in our city in Los Angeles and wanted a beach house. And he had to prove that. So his commute for work, because it was, you know, some days two hours, right? Yeah. So we did get away with that on, on like it was right around 60 miles, but typically is 100 without compensating factors. As far as like some different market trends, like first of all, like how would you categorize the rate environment last year, kind of as a whole, just from a high mm -hmm. level? And how do you see that changing in say 2024? Uh, you wanna be more specific by quarter, but I guess what, you know, how do you, what would be your classification or categorization of last year as a whole compared to what you maybe would predict or kind of expect for this year? Yeah. So I'm an optimist, uh, optimist, right? Yeah. So I keep telling everyone, I'm like, I see light at the end of the tunnel. We are not there yet. And I think it'll be closer to third quarter to where we start really start to see momentum. Um, there's a couple of indicating factors that everyone should be aware of, right? And that's called don't watch the news first and foremost, right? Um, you guys need to look at websites called like MBS Live is a, is a good one for you guys to, to look at. Um, a lot of us mortgage brokers and bankers will go to that website and pay a subscription fee because they are so accurate and they show graphs and things of what's going on. The driving forces that you need to be, pay attention to are the CPI report. Um, that's the consumer uh, production report. Um, that is a direct correlation with inflation and what is what is happening in the United States. Um, we have the CPI reports and for lack of a better term have sucked last year they are finally becoming more normalized and even neutral which is driving the rates and that's why the fed is coming out and saying hey well likely it's a good indication that inflation is coming down so we'll start lowering the rates now there's other indicators that you need to pay, pay attention to like the jobs report and the biggest thing that you know people will put quotations around is it's an election year if you look at all the past election years rates do tend to fall, right? Just like gas prices and things like that. So as we kind of go into the year of 2024, there's all these indicating factors that rates will likely fall. Now, a misconception among the industry is, hey, when the Fed rate reduces, mortgage rates fall. They are not directly correlated. Right. The Fed rate is more of the credit cards, the HELOCs, things like that that are going to get directly impacted. But Un indirectly, the mortgage rates will fall. Um, I was just reading a statistic the other day, and you know, don't quote me on this, but I, I heard it, is when the Fed comes out and says, hey, I'm going to lower rates, the actual graph shows that it's about 11 months later when you start to see the actual trend, you know, for it to transact properly. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that because we are in a heightened market. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the trends and they, the, the stock markets move and then it directly relates to the mortgage rates as well. Um, let me give a quick example, just, just to highlight how much movement we have seen even in the last six, seven months. So six, seven months ago, we were dipping into the 8% on a standard, and let's just take a conventional loan with, you know, average credit score, average down payment. We were dipping into the eights. Right to give you an idea on a conventional loan, today we're anywhere from you know six point six two five to six point eight seven five on an average conventional loan. So that's mm -hmm. a huge drastic in or decrease, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, people ask me every day, "Hey, rates are going to fall. Should we lock today?" And I'm like, "That's risky because we don't know. Do I think eventually rates will fall potentially?" But to give you an example, so going back three weeks ago, rates took a big dip. I locked a bunch of clients that following week rates went up another probably three eighths of a, a percent last i believe it was tuesday or wednesday rates went down a quarter percent then on friday was the biggest spike we've seen in the last 12 months so we lost anywhere from like a quarter to three eighths of a percent for these clients that's huge yeah. so if i tell a client hey yeah, rates are falling, and the very next day, the Friday, they lose a quarter percent in the rate. I mean, they might not qualify anymore. Mm -hmm. It's because of the market volatility. There's so many impacting factors, such as the global war, stocks. You know, we're in a bull market right now. There's so many things that are making this market shift a quarter percent, you know, weekly right now. But as an overall trend, 
I do predict that rates will go down, especially third, fourth quarter in, in, right. in this year. Yeah, I think like the early indications are that in their next meeting in March, they're probably going to remain steadfast and, mm-hmm. and maybe not dip again. Um, and we've seen a, a pretty significant an acute drop in inflation. I know we were hovering, I want to say around eight or nine percent, and that I believe has come down to about three percent currently. And mm-hmm. I know they're targeting right around two for for a healthy, right. for a healthy environment. So we've we've curbed that um, pretty quickly within the last six to nine months. Um, and so maybe yeah. we aren't going to see the five six you know rate drops that Goldman Sachs predicted you know last year. But um, I think once we start to you know, in the next, like you said, I, I, bl- I agree with you. I think Q3, Q4 is when things are really going to start to stabilize. Probably, in my opinion, I would say probably low 6%. Mm-hmm. Once we understand that that's kind of the new that. norm, yeah. I think the, the a lot of the reluctancy and, this, and the hesitancy among kind of the quote-unquote rate-sensitive buyers, per mm-hmm. se, um, is that, you know, they don't want this... It, they don't want FOMO. They don't want to get locked in at a six and three eighths. And then in a year and a half, it's down to 4.5. I think eventually we're going to just, we're just going to be steady right around 6%, low 6%. That would be the best thing for us. And that'll probably at some point, I think people will recognize that it's kind of, that's the norm. That's just the new norm. So if you're still sensitive at that point, it's like keep waiting on the sidelines. But I think that's ultimately where, where we end up. And, you know, if, if there are buyers who are, are ready and willing and able today, mm-hmm. um, you know, the difference between, say, six and a half or six, talk to a good real estate agent. There's there's ways to, to kind of help. help well, let's out touch there. on that. And I love where you're going with this. And there's a couple couple aspects that you touched on here. And that's, you know, the rates will fall to six. And some people predict that they'll be in the low fives, right? I think that's extreme, and I actually think that would be detrimental to the industry. And if they did drop into the 5.5% area, everyone's going to list their house. Buyers are going to come out of the woodworks, and I always tell my team, too. We have hundreds, hundreds of pre-qualified clients waiting on the sidelines for rates to come into the high fives, low sixes. So simple supply and demand dynamics, especially in Arizona, which we'll talk on more specifically, is... You know, we already li- are limited on supply. We just saw it with the last little decrease over the last few weeks. Mm-hmm. And it was, I told, told, you know, my team and clients, I'm like, it was a light switch. The moment rates started falling, it was a floodgates of people calling us right now to get back into the market. And supply immediately dropped again in Arizona. Mm-hmm. So it was actually beneficial to our clients and people out there considering buying to buy now because you know rates are going to eventually fall in the next, let's call it, year or two. So if you could buy now, that's going to stop you from getting price gouged when all these people come to the market and you have, you're have bidding against seven, eight, nine people like we were two years ago. Yeah, uh, yeah. Q1 and 2 of 22, I mean, you know, obviously I can't speak for, for every realtor out there, but the one the people that I was working with who – had a lot of liquidity and and were even cash buyers. Mm-hmm. We there were times where we were making competitive offers as a cash buyer with shortened inspection periods, with waived anything and everything you can think of. Yeah, and we weren't even landing in the top three. Close. I yeah. mean, there were deals. There were deals that I literally did not even get done just because buyers had the fatigue of I cannot believe how insane this is that we can't land a house and they just, and they just stepped out of the market at that point. So I don't think we'll necessarily get back there, but yeah. um, the people that have the ability to make a purchase right now, mm-hmm. um, there's still enough flexibility and leverage that buyers have where you can kind of compensate for, for some of the shortcomings in rate or price. Well, let's, let's touch on that too, because you're spot on where you're going with this. And the strategy is a lot of the people that are still waiting might not know of the temporary buy down option. So I could do a temporary buy down as long as it's not an investment property. I could do it on an FHA loan. I could do it on a conventional loan. I could do it on jumbo loans, right? And most people don't know you could do it on jumbo loans too. There are investors out there that allow for it. So if your hesitation is, well, I still don't want a 6.75 rate, right? Mm -hmm. And I want it to be lower. So what a temporary buy down is, is essentially Ross as your agent would go and negotiate some type of seller credit. What we typically need, and I'll just for simple sake, is right around 2% of the purchase price that we'll need for a seller credit. What we do is we apply that towards your rate. Now, 
So if you're at a starting rate of 6.75, the most common temporary buy down is 2.1 buy down. Mm -hmm. So let's say you're at a 6.75. It is 2% lower your first year. So instead, of, so now you're at a 4.75. Your second year, you're 1% lower. So now you're at a 5.75. And then it returns to your starting rate of 6.75 for the remaining 27 years. Well, what we're discussing right now is you're probably never going to see that 6.75 because you're going to refinance within that two-year period because rates are naturally going to be lower. Well, a lot of people that are high level and know about points and t you know buy downs and things like that go, well, yeah, but if I refinance, I'm going to lose all that money and leave it on the table. Well, what's cool about a temporary buy down is it's not paid in a lump sum like mm -hmm. what you've heard of maybe a permanent buy down or paying points traditionally. It's paid out monthly in like a little piggy bank and it gets paid out to your payment, right? Reducing your payment. So even if you refi if you're in a two one buy down, you refinance or sell your home in let's say a year, you still have fifty percent of that proration mm -hmm. that you get back in the form of a check. So it's a win win. There's no caveats, no catches to it. And now you're paying so to give you an example, if you're at like a, a four hundred thousand dollar home, that's saving you like four hundred and fifty dollars a month your first year and about $225 a month, your second year. Yeah, that's actually, that's, that's super interesting. So mm -hmm. I didn't realize that a, I didn't realize that it wasn't a lump sum and that it mm -hmm. is prorated. So, because there was always this question of, well, if I'm not going to stay in my house for more than say three years, or I don't anticipating, then, you know, maybe we should get a lower purchase price as opposed to a seller credit for a rate buy down. Cause I didn't want to lose, you know, in this case, maybe that $20,000 up right. front, but even if they do decide to sell or refinance into a different product and move or whatever the case is, they still get the remaining of that credit proration to apply either back to them in the form of cash, I would assume, mm -hmm. or if they refinance towards maybe another rate buy down or closing costs or, mm -hmm. or just another form of credits there. Yeah. So you get back in the form of a check, right? Um, you wouldn't be able to reapply it towards, let's say, if you were to do a refinance, but you're refinancing into stability, right? So if, if it were my opinion, I would probably at least let a year go by until we see those rates drop and how low they're actually going to go and then make that decision. Because to me, I'm like, okay, if you could refinance permanently into your second year of the temporary buy down, I'd rather just get that done. Now, the reason why I say you can't like reapply that to a temporary buy down is because this there's no advantage to it, right? Because you're taking your own money and just basically spreading it out over 12 months versus just, you know, putting it in a loan. Now, what you could apply it towards is a permanent buy down, which then you're permanently buying down your rate. You know, if you know you're going to be in your home for an extended period of time, then that might make sense. Got it. Yep. So there's a keen difference between a permanent rate buy down That's and temporary correct. rate buy down. Yep. Speaking kind of within the context of, Luxury properties, cash flow. I mean, I'm very cap rate driven. DSCR is, would you say, the best option? Or I guess it depends on their financial situation with regards to self employed or W 2, because the best is always going to be a conventional jumbo mortgage, right? So I mentioned bank statements. I mentioned DSCR. I have a no income doc, which is based solely off credit score. Not solely, but it's more heavily weighted off credit score and reserves, right? And you don't have to show any in income, employment, you know, anything like that. The interest rate's much higher because you're now narrowing it down and being weighted on just very specific items. Um, that way you don't have to touch the bank statements. You don't have to show any rental income. I also have, you know, a one year P and L that we basically go off a signed P and L from a CPA. Your interest rate's going to suck, but there's options there, right? Um, you typically have to have very high credit scores and things like that. So there are compensating factors so, in that. So when we find you a really great deal and maybe you get into that product, yeah. with the expectation that you'll, uh, you'll move into something else after a short period of time. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, that's in, in the rate, you know, again, it's, it could be a lot higher, but on a really spectacular deal with super high cash flow, then, mm -hmm. you know, maybe you're taking a little bit less. But I say that it's all relative, right? Because a lot of these high end clients and investors, they're like, I just want my house. They want somewhere to go. That's theirs. And a lot of them will go to a hard money lender and those hard money lenders are 12 to 15%, if not higher, depending on who you talk to. So to me, I'm like, that's true. They do you know, have. In retrospect, it is a good option if they can't find another option to finance. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's that's yeah, super interesting. It's it's a great product for people, and like you said, the the hard money loan. I mean, they do offer you know I O. They do offer you know long term rental mm-hmm. loan products, but at twelve and fifteen percent, it's it it would be tough to find a deal that really makes a ton of sense if you're only looking to put you know twenty to twenty five percent down. Yeah, right. The side of the market that I specialize in, and this is why this is super important to talk to you, is because not everyone has, you know, two and a half million bucks cash mm-hmm. to shell out on these properties. So we want to find different ways to get good debt, right? There's, mm-hmm. you know, debt is a good thing as long as it's good debt. I always like to tell people. And if you look at all of the short term rentals, for example, let's just use Airbnb as an example. In the greater Phoenix market, there's give or take 5,000 Airbnbs. Someone could do a search right now on Airbnb and just say Scottsdale, Arizona, not a designated amount of people or date, just push search. If on one, two, three, and four bedroom houses, Airbnb will say there's a thousand plus results. So we don't know exactly what that number is, mm-hmm. but when, as soon as you start to go five bedroom. Just in Scottsdale. Greater Scottsdale. Okay. They'll show some areas. Yeah, right. Which is a lot. Which is a lot. Yeah. And we don't know the exact number. Yeah. We just know that it's a thousand plus. But as mm-hmm. soon as you go to, say, five bedroom, six bedroom, seven bedroom, eight bedroom, you'll see the exact number. Mm-hmm. It'll say, it'll go from four bedrooms at a thousand plus to five bedrooms being 596, six bedrooms being 297. So you look at all of the houses on a supply curve. The area of opportunity is in the high occupancy, high bedroom houses, bigger outdoor spaces. Mm -hmm. And that's how we avoid all of this conversation around, is it too saturated? Is it the right time? Is it the wrong time to get in? Let's just put a product in the marketplace that is very differentiated, that is really easy for people to find and not kind of getting lost in the mix. And um, those are usually the properties that uh, tend to perform the best. So I mentioned, so Arizona has a, a unique market, one being Barrett Jackson and the waste management open following it. So I had recently forgot. So a year ago, I tried to rent out my house and throw it up there and I ran out of time. You know, I delayed on that <laughs> and I left it up and I didn't even know. And I put it up for, you know, a ridiculous amount. I think it's like $2,400 a night type of thing. And randomly, I just got two hits on it and they said, you know, I'll, for just four days, four or five days, they said, you know, I'll give you 20 grand for four or five days. And that is something that I want you to touch on is, you know, you, you're, I've called you a few times and said, Hey, hey how, how do I set this up? What do I need? What do I do? You know, how should I approach this? Is it worth it? You know, I don't have a hot tub, but I have a pool in my backyard. Does that matter? You know, can that fetch me more? Should I put a hot tub in my backyard? You know, is it worth doing that and just rent it out during these weekends? Um, cause that's a substantial amount of money. And I kind of panicked last minute and I got all stressed out. I'm like, I'm not going to do it. You know, is that something that you do coaching on? You know what? Yeah. I mean, so I, I have, I have done some coaching. I have mm-hmm. charged kind of a, an hourly rate to kind of help people yeah. with their listings and, and set it up. Um, in, in your situation or really in anyone's situation who is kind of looking at maybe renting their primary, it's like, well, first of all, you know, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? Mm-hmm. Right. If you're going to rent your primary to go spend, you know, $400 a night and live at a, ho- live out of a hotel. Mm-hmm. That doesn't make a ton of sense. Correct. But if you have a trip coming up, if you know, you're going to be gone anyway, you're going to be back home for the holidays, or you're going to be in, you know, travel in the world for three, four weeks at a time. Maybe that's a little bit of a different situation. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the amenities that people really seek here, um, a pool's a must. I mean, it's, no. in my opinion, Running an Airbnb without a pool is a, is a non-starter. Um, not just a pool. It's really not even enough. You have to have one of two heated bodies of water. Mm-hmm. So you could have a pool with a pool heater where you can heat the pool up to about 85 degrees, mm-hmm. which is typically what people want, or a hot tub. So I'd say you have to do one or the other. I think outdoor living has still always been a huge amenity. Mm-hmm. Um, privacy, and, and not just like, not just outdoor privacy, mm-hmm. like seclusion from where the bedrooms are from yeah. each other. Cause the best renters are generally two, three families, or you have the grandparents and the grandkids and then the, you know, the parents, they like to have their ensuite bathrooms. They like the configuration of the floor plan mm-hmm. to be 
in a way in which they're not just so right next to each other. Like hallways with like four bedrooms on one hallway is not really the best layout. For sure. You know, that's not the same as a, you know, four bedroom house with all four bedrooms on the same side down a hallway could rent 30% less than another four bed, three bath house split. that's actually split mm -hmm. that has a better configuration. So right. that's just something to, to kind of be cognizant of uh, when actually selecting um, a short term rental property. But yeah, I mean, at this point, I would target 12 occupants, you can advertise two occupants per bed, as long as that bed is a full size or bigger. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, unique beds, 12 plus occupants. Um, there are four bedroom houses, I manage a couple of them that are still successful. But I really for somebody with not that much experience, um, you're going to be a little safer at a five plus bedroom. Um, and it doesn't have to be a true bedroom. In Arizona, we classify a bedroom as a space with a with egress, a window and a closet. You could convert for Airbnb purposes, you can convert a little office nook into a bedroom. You could consider it's that. One of those pull down beds or something like not that. Not even that. Yeah. You just, it maybe has a big opening. You mm -hmm. just close it in drywall. You put a Got door it. on it. Throw a bed in there mm -hmm. for all intents and purposes. That's a bedroom, right? Maybe when you go to sell the house, you convert it back into an office. But um, yeah, I would say five bedrooms, three and a half bath, pool, outdoor living is a is a is a must. Yeah. Um, and then just be cognizant of the operational expenses. Um, new construction's great because you have a high efficiency heaters, water heaters, um, HVAC heating and cooling. So. Yeah, I mean, so it's I want to touch on the luxury side too, because I know you have a niche, and I was so fascinated the first time you came to me, and this was you know a year and a half ago we talked on this, but you said that you you obviously you're well connected in the luxury space and networked amongst you know some wealthy people as well, and they were actually hitting you up and saying, hey, when the Airbnb was at its top, and saying, hey, can you rent out my house and can you manage that for me, and you know there's so many different opportunities within that. Is that something that you're still doing? You know, in that Paradise Valley area and things like that. I run a boutique brokerage. Mm -hmm. My my services to my clients are very personalized. Mm -hmm. um, it that model is very different than the larger scale management companies right. that are just looking for as much volume as possible. So, um, people ask me all the time. You know, hey, you know, can you manage my house for six months out of the year? Or hey, can you kind of help me? Generally speaking, I mean. Generally speaking, my answer is that doesn't really fit kind of my business and what I'm looking for. Right. What does fit my business and what I'm looking for is an investor who wants to work with me to help select the right asset in the market, right? Mm -hmm. There could be, you know, 75 homes within their budget, within kind of non-HOA and all these criteria we're looking for. Um, they want a knowledgeable resource to figure out of those 75 available options, which is likely going to be set up for the most for the most success. Right. And so I would want to work with that person and actually have quite a bit of say in which asset they purchase. Mm -hmm. So I kind of help guide them in that in the right direction as far as the purchase. Once the asset is purchased in a very time and economical manner, we like to set it up inside of about 60 days. So some people might that might be listening that have purchased a $2 million house, they might say, Whoa, I bought a house, it took me four or five months between the furniture and the interior designers, try to get it done in 60 days. Time is money, right? right? And then after we have that set up, then those are the houses that I want to manage. Mm -hmm. So I'm generally only managing what I kind of pre-selected and sold on that, on the front end of that whole process. Mm -hmm. um, if someone comes to me with, you know, a great hillside paradise valley house hey i don't really want to sell but i want to move out i'm going to downsize i would like to make this a full-time rental property would you manage it those are the kind of deals i take a harder look at but generally speaking i want to keep what i manage in my portfolio as properties that i've really kind of hand selected myself yeah. or at least played a big role in hand selecting well, you know they'll produce or, too yeah. i like to i like to be able to say that i can put my money where my mouth is i love that yeah so these out-of-staters that don't know the Arizona market well, um, is there a handful of properties that you already know that are out there and ready to go that you're like waiting for the right client to say, hey, call me so I already have it? Or do you find off-market stuff? What, yeah, what's, what's yeah your that's, so that's a good question. Um, at any one particular point in time, I always have two to three kind of off-market options that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. A lot of those are usually 
pre in the pre-construction, not necessarily pre-construction phase, but pre-completion phase. Mm -hmm. So uh, I network with a lot of builders and developers. I know which ones like these kind of higher occupancy style homes. And I might know that, hey, this developer has a five bedroom, four bath coming in three months. He's got one coming in six months. So I always kind of have that on my radar so that when that investor inquires to the website, gives me a call, hey, you know, what do you have available? Let's look at some on market options. I always have a good amount of kind of off market possibilities that would be a good fit for him as well. Um, but a lot, but a lot of the time it's, it's, deals that we can do that are MLS deals that we mm -hmm. can negotiate a good price and good concessions and that just kind of fit, fit the buy box essentially. Yeah. And I think every realtor should, should have the kind of same, same outlook, which is anyone can create a listing and, and look at MLS and look at Zillow. Right. But the real value information is the, the main the commodity the professional in that market, that and, niche yeah. and the information too. Mm -hmm. The information of knowing what's coming, knowing what builders have what product and yeah. inventory on their way, and just having a good pulse on that in a, in a few different areas um, is really, I think, one of the one of the areas I would yeah. say. I always see at the new build build broker opens and things like that. So yeah, yeah. always yeah, totally. So um, random question. So like for myself, you know, I have a couple of buddies and things like that that we're we're always looking for investment opportunities and maybe go in on something. Is that something that you know for the people that are watching maybe? You know, there's three, four of your clients that, you know, to take down a bigger property that cash flows a little bit better. Is that something you could put a set, you know, set up? Yeah, hundred percent. So going back to the DSCR, let's just say that that's the loan product, right? It's an asset mm -hmm. base. It's closed in an LLC. It, if it, let's say it's a 20 per, let's say it's a $2 million property that requires 20% down. Mm -hmm. You're going to have closing and furniture costs, but for the sake of conversation, you're going to need about 400,000 to close that deal. Right. That LLC could be a multi-member LLC. You could mm -hmm. have four partners that each have 25% uh, ownership of that LLC and they split the buy-in evenly, right? right? So instead of, you know, a $2 million property with one that's owned by, it's owned by an entity, but it's a multi-member entity, right. right? So it just diversifies the the down payment. It's maybe $100,000 per person mm -hmm. that they can get into that product. They split the onboarding costs, furniture, amenities, pool heater, et cetera. And then they're on the hook for, you know, tw each 25% of the operating cost, but they reap the uh, benefit of 25% of the, uh, the income as well. I love it. So t very, very possible, very doable. Um, people do it all the time. And fractional ownership is actually something that's been around for years and years and years. And it's actually kind of making a little bit of a comeback. So we'll see it more and more. So, and I know you touched on this and I see a lot of the Airbnb homes being listed for sale right now, especially in Southern, like South Scottsdale, let's say, do you think they're failing because of there's too much volume or they're too, they're not put together well enough? Like, what do you think the main reason that they're failing? Yeah. The, the main reason I think they're failing is because when they set that property up originally, mm -hmm. they're taking iPhone photos their linens are kind of mismatched. They were providing a lodging accommodation for renters and they were making money doing so. Mm -hmm. Today, just providing a lodging accommodation for renters does not work the same way it did three, four or five years ago. You gotta bring it. You yeah. gotta have great photography. You have to have premium linens. You can't have, you know, disjointed ruffled sheets. It You have to bring it with the amenities. You have to actually invest in quality a quality offering or else you're just going to get kind of left in the dust. And these people who maybe once three years ago didn't have to do much and were really happy with their income don't like the idea that they may have to reinvest in that yeah. property, put more money into the property um, just to get the same type of returns that they maybe were getting three years ago. So I think that's forcing a lot of them to sell. And frankly, the Airbnbs that you do see on the market that are looking to sell mm -hmm. again, think about that demand curve. They're the three <coughs> bed, two bath, three bed, three bath, no pools. A lot of times. So mm -hmm. the properties that just are getting completely lost in the, sh in the mix and that are just not differentiated. There's just nothing special that's going to attract that potential renter. I need that property. Right. They're listing on the market and they're uh, hoping to, hoping to get an exit. But again, the ones that are you don't see the really well suited. Yeah. I mean, you can go to Airbnb. Look at the ones oh, that you, are. You immediately could see the differences. You could see the yeah. difference, and the ones that you look at, they're like, "Whoa, that's that's a big boy house," or "That's I could see why that's successful." Mm -hmm. You don't see those sitting on the MLS for sale. It's for sure, the, it's the lower end. It's yeah. the lower end stuff. 
So with that being said, so if, if a client calls you and, you know, there is thinking about doing something like this, Hey, I want to get into this space. Cause obviously if you do it right, it is successful. If you were to take, and I, this is a loaded question, so be a conservative, it's just an estimate. If you were to get into, let's say, a six hundred to $800,000 home, let's call it a four-bedroom you know, pool and things like that, what is the startup cost for, like, getting it ready, you know, on a conservative level, not super over the top? Yeah, just yeah so startup costs are going to be, so I look at startup costs in two different ways. There's the, there's the furniture aspect. Mm-hmm. Uh, Which God knows that could add up. It does add yeah. up. And that's not just furniture. That's, you know, kitchen utensils, paper goods, right. everything. And then there's what I call amenitizing the property, which is the, you add the pool heater in, you add the putting green in, mm-hmm. you pull all the sod out for artificial turf. So you don't have landscapers there every week, right. you know, in people's backyards, leaf blowing, mm-hmm. right? As far as the furniture costs, I always shoot for about a $20,000 budget for every 1,000 livable square feet. That's great. So on yeah. about a 4,000 square foot house, I would give my clients the expectation that we're going to spend about 80 grand getting the house fit and finished. In addition to that, sometimes you need these other amenities. I, I keep coming back to the pool heater and the putting greens and the, the gym converted weight rooms and the game rooms, right? Sometimes if we have opportunities to put that in, that's going to be additional, but just for the sake of kind of a rule of thumb, estimate including outdoor furniture, about $20,000 for every 1000 livable square that's feet. That's great feedback. That's awesome. Um, and you, you mentioned renovations and things like that. I'm assuming you have all those great contacts and referrals for people too, right? Yeah. So my process from selecting a property to purchase to I'm receiving passive income Mm -hmm. is completely streamlined. So I'll help you on the, on identifying the property and providing pro formas and cash flow analysis to actually identify, okay, this is our expected profit and loss. This is our cap rate. This is our cash on cash return. Here's how we can think about this from an illustrative perspective. The onboarding process of interior designers, which I work with a few that are all local are really great. They have experience in Mm -hmm. furnishing luxury short-term rentals, which is different than staging a property for selling purposes. Right. Two totally different. It's, it's a, it's a art, not a science. Some people might say, and then the contractors to actually do the work, hardscape, landscape, um, like I mentioned, in closing walls for, you know, that are offices into bedrooms, just little and things like that. that might be like intimidating that. to some people because back in 2010, I used to do flip every two to three months, right? When the market was com- right, coming out of the recession and I used to go down to the auctions and you're like, well, I'm going to tear down walls and oh my yeah. God, that's crazy. It's not as hard as you think. If you have somebody that knows what they're doing and they have the right connections, it's it's crazy how simple it is it just takes a little bit of money and and it's done fairly quickly too yeah i have a i have a a great trusted network of Mm -hmm. service providers again from interior designers to contractors general contractors subcontractors and i manage a lot you know i'm not necessarily the one selecting the the couch for Mm -hmm. the living room but i'm involved in every step of the way i'm gonna let the contractors do their thing i'm gonna let the designers do their thing but i'm it's all kind of under my sort of oversight that's really cool and you develop a relationship long term too, and just rinse and repeat. That's cool. Yeah, exactly. And and again, the the boutique model wh- why it really works for me is because I, I mean, I really care about the asset. I mean, if I was spread 50, 60, 80, 100 properties, then I don't. It's impossible to know the intricacies and uh, the the dynamics. And every property poses a different set of challenges that on a smaller scale, you can address very easily on a proactive basis as opposed to a reactive basis. Just, I wouldn't have the ability to have the same level of quality control and assurance that I do right. at, a, at a smaller scale. Yep. So That's really cool. And I want to touch on something. And obviously he's going down a path of saying, you know, if you're interested, call him because he'll, he has all that guidance it's about putting a plan together. If you're interested, call him and do a discovery call. That's how my team operates too. So, you know, I have my own branch and a whole team of gals that uh, does all the operations and stuff, but I keep myself free to have the same conversations that he's talking about on the financing side. So if you go to a traditional bank, Chase, Wells Fargo, U.S. Bank, one of the first things they do is, all right, let's take an application and pull your credit, see if you qualify. Well, what good is that? You know, you're like, I'm interested six months out. Let's see, let's put a plan together. Maybe you have to get your credit scores up, you know, things like that. So... You know, whether you call Ross or myself, 
what I typically do for those clients that are even interested is we jump on what I call a discovery call and we go over your finances. I have you maybe send me your credit karma report so we're not doing a hard inquiry on you. There's no fees. It's just a little bit of your time and say, hey, what does this look like for you? What do these payments look like? What does the rates look like? What are the contracting, you know, the pro formos look like on this? Totally. And it, it's honestly very easy for us. Yeah, I'm a big fan of that, uh, mm -hmm. the discovery call as yeah. well. I, I get on the phone with people and said, oh, just, you know, for, you know, just, just for the record, I'm three months out, I'm like three months out. I've been, there's people I've been engaged right. in conversations for two years. and a half years. Yeah, so, you for know, sure. You know oh, I mean? yeah. So like, let's just prepare you for when that time is right. Mm -hmm. I'm not going anywhere in the business. You're not going into the business. I'm going to, I'll be yeah. here, you know, you'll be here. So yeah, whether it's, you know, today or 18 months, 24 months, like we, we got people at all, all stages of, of right. the uh, sales life cycle. So yeah, hundred, hundred percent. I'm totally on board with, with the discovery call aspect and just forming a relationship and kind of going from there. That's exactly right. I love it. Cool. I think on, on that note, um, might want to wrap things up. Uh, Shane, again, really appreciate uh, you coming in. I learned a lot. Hopefully you've learned a lot as well. Um, thanks to EDEM visuals, great studio. Um, and uh, yeah, hope everyone enjoyed, uh, I would say the episode, but uh, I don't really have a, <laughs> hope, everyone, rolling. hope everyone enjoyed the content. Appreciate it. Thanks guys. <laughs> For more information on what I do and how I can potentially help in your investment journey, uh, visit luxurycashflow.com, uh, Instagram, luxurycashflow, and TikTok and YouTube as well.